It's live. Hello, right everyone. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give everyone a little minute to just like sit, get maybe like a glass of water or something yeah. because get we're a, rushed get a, get a little snack. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 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 for those who don't know us, my name is Mel. Actually, it's Mary F, but it's so hard to say in English. And you can just call me Mel. But you can call me Z. That's just one letter. So, yeah. yeah, I have many names. And I'm here with Colin Bennett, also known as Onion Skin. I'm Colin. <laughs> and we have Rebecca with us, too. Hello. And we're going to be talking about lots of rig stuff, uh, particularly rigging misconceptions. There's a very popular topic right now. People like rigging. But is there one way to do it? Is there many ways to do it? What do animators actually like to work with? Is it is it nice to have lots of fancy features or should we be keeping it simple? We're going to be exploring that, discussing it, and maybe having an argument or two. Everybody knows yeah. that the only <laughs> good way to rig is to get paper, scissors, and metal rivet. Because that is the, the truest way to do it. Back to the ancestor we go. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> And uh, don't forget that this thing is live. We are here staring at, not you, but the chat section. Mm -hmm. So if you have any question, you can always reach out in the chat and say hello or say questions and mm. stuff. We'll try to remember before the end to go through a lot of the questions and fill them in. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, there's, a away. there's a Q&A um, column as well, I believe. Fantastic. There's yeah, there's yeah. chat and then Q and A. Uh, there's also polls um, and handouts. Wow! All right, that's pretty cool. So we may end up. We've got a whole bunch of rigs open on our screens that we may go on tours through. Uh, it's more or less of a visual. We'll see where we end up. Uh, we've got a big list of stuff to go through on kind of just what we do and do not like to see because our three backgrounds are quite quite different from one another. We've all had different career paths. Like, yeah, let's talk about that. Like, Mel, what's what have you sort of seen and used when it comes to rigs? Okay, so uh, also in terms of background, my background is from paper animation. So I went from like paper animation to rigging, well, paper animation to comp to rigging. So that's usually where I stand. And my approach in rigging usually is um, um, use pegs as, multi, as much as you can, put, in for, put deformers everywhere and make it work. Um, because I think that pegs and deformer are very easy and people can just um, adapt very quickly to them. I'm less into the crazy experimental side of rig where you put constraints and stuff everywhere. It can work for some things, but not usually for what I do. Yay! Mm. Meanwhile, I've probably had a few difficult lessons to learn along the way because I've always been more of that technical side of things, <laughs> enjoying stitching different notes together and sort of figuring out what happens. It's been great for learning because rather than just following along with, like when people ask, how do you rig? And then get like an instruction manual and put everything together in order. That can be nice for getting something working, but you're not very well equipped for being able to solve problems and engineer new things along the way. Experimenting is great for figuring out new solutions to different problems. However, you can run the risk of over-engineering things, giving so many bells and whistles that it feels great to build, but it doesn't feel quite so great to bring to life. As soon as you start hitting anything that the rig wasn't specifically designed to do, things can get difficult, which I think, uh, Rebecca, you could probably speak to a bit as an animator. Yeah, so I'm a senior animator at Mercury Filmworks, and... Uh, I just started learning to rig last year. Um, and yeah, like, so the thing with studio rigs is there d does tend to be a lot of bells and whistles. In the technical sense, it's great. Uh, it makes sense. But if it's, if it's a rig that really slows down the animator, that kind of kills the point of creating a rig. Because, like, the point of a rig is to make the, the animator, animation, like, a little bit easier and uh, more uh, time efficient for the for the animator, but it doesn't make sense if you're trying to drag an arm and it's loading and freezing the program. So are there any particular traits that you've seen in rigs that have come your way that were designed to try and make animation easier, but they were actually a hurdle and held you back a bit? 
I think uh, from what I'm seeing is they're trying to solve a lot of the comp issues within the animation stage. And I find that's like slowing down the animation itself because I remember with some rigs, like the texture lines will be already there. Like the, like different effects would already be there. Um, like if you had one arm go in front of the body, the comp would kind of solve the issue for you. So it like creates the. Like for self traced lines, you, you mean? Yeah. Like let's say it's a character that has like. Like, we'll say Mickey Mouse. Uh, he, he has a black face, black arms. So when his hand went in front of his face, there would be an, a white outline automatically. Speaking of which. That's a good example. So yeah. here's one that I made about a year ago when I was really into exactly what you're talking about. As and a wait, I remember thing. that you showed me this. And you were like, oh, my God, look at that. It's so cool. I, I was, was like... so proud of myself. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was brutally and honest being like, you know what? Did your eyes roll? Um <laughs> So hang on, let me go to uh, render view here and see if it's... So right away, you can see how long that took to render. So the brief was the compositing was intended to have this like three-tiered shading, right? So highlights on one end, shade on the other with a secondary highlight. I was like, oh, rubbing my hands with glee, right? This would be fantastic. Let's try and see if we can engineer this as something automatic in the animation stage so it's already there um, by at the beginning. And I spent... I kid you not, like nearly a whole month mucking around with trying to get it to run. And um, frankly, it just wasn't really worth it. It was a really hard lesson in less is more mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I had a whole phase, right, with, um, let me get back to the main display, uh, not that one. Yeah, I remember. Um, you remember working with this, Beck? I, made I remember you. you showing me this rig. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then I went behind your back. I was like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> there we go, right? Uh, it's like a phase, I think, that a lot of um, rookie riggers will go through because we fall in love with this stuff, right? It's like, hey, we, our job is to try and make animators' lives easier. And we throw in all these fancy contraptions that we think are going to be really cool. Um, but it, it it can be difficult for animators because um, you kind of get locked into this marionette thing. One of the big misconceptions of rigging overall, uh, sorry, rig-based animation for a lot of... Um, uh, even just like the enthusiasts, just people who watch animation is puppets are like lame or they, they look puppety. It's like this, you know, marionette looking show. Animating with puppet is cheating. The only true animation is paper animation. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm sure, I'm sure everyone here has probably met someone with that opinion. It's probably a, a, a rare thought amongst the audience. Cause you've come here to learn <laughs> like you're interested in it. Right. Um, but we're in this phase now as rigging has continued to evolve where it can start to, it, it's become its own medium. It's more like stop motion. It's to, to, to the, just, I guess the end user, it can almost be difficult to tell apart from uh, frame by frame. Like, I, I guess like all the shows that you've been on back tangled. Uh, well, Hilda. I know Hilda, a lot of people, like I've talked to people about how Hilda's rigged and they're like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I, I took it took me until episode three of like really closely analyzing it before I was able to figure out if it was actually rigged or not. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be a lot of the brief right now uh, that we get from creators is, yes, we want this to be rigged for economical reasons, but we don't want it to look it. Mm -hmm. So, so much of it comes back to just being a good animator. Can you, how can you figure out to get these puppets to act, to express, to perform and have life? Yeah, I think because, you know, our talk, we could talk about rigging for five hours, but the talk is called Rigging Misconceptions. So that's why we're going to keep bringing this subject. So mm -hmm. we see lots of questions in the chat that are amazing. We might not have time to answer all of those, but they're amazing. And I I mean, we're going to note them down and, you know, keep them in mind. But if I can add something, one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, in rigging is that it's cheaper than hand-drawn because it can be in some occasion, but it's not a true, like a hundred percent sure fact. And maybe Rebecca also like you, you probably have something to say about that too. But like the, the, the thing that we hear a lot in the industry that is, I think the thing that is the most detrimental to rigging animation is that a lot of time rigged animation or cut out animation or puppet animation is not seen as its own medium. It's seen as a cheaper way to do hand-drawn. Like, some people have a project. 
They're like, we want to make it hand drawn. And then producer says, we don't have budget for hand drawn. They're like, okay, we'll just do it rigged. And this is usually the pitfall of most rigged animation show because they were not thought or engineered as cutout show. They were thought as hand drawn. Then hand drawn was too expensive because it is. It's really expensive to do hand drawn. Mm. And then it gets thrown into like, we're going to rig those characters. It's going to be true. It doesn't work like that. And what I want to add for that is that this logic only applies to cut out and hand drawn because no one is going to have a show hand drawn and be like, oh, it's too expensive. I'll do it in 3D, right? Like, <laughs> we're like, I have a show in 3D. Oh, it's too expensive. I'll do it in like hand drawn. Like, it's really just for cut out. Like, people have this misconception that it's actually super cheap. And uh, it's not true. It's true if you think of your show as being puppet based. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wonderful things you can do to animate fast. Mm -hmm. I think Rebecca can talk about that for her amazing like work she's been doing for the um, 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 Royal Pain a little oh. <laughs> to make. Um, like you can you can do these amazing animation with these fantastic puppets, and doing that in hand drawn would just not hit the same. Would not be the same at all because you you know what you're doing. Like you thought about it. I think so. this moves us quite swiftly into how broad. Uh, cutout and rig based animation can be there's a common misconception we get from a lot of our students that there's like one way to do it uh, but it really can be as broad as drawing itself uh, and uh, a lot of riggers moving into the industry can therefore like they learn a way to do it and then a try and attempt to apply that method to every production they're on regardless of whether the style demands that that's how the characters move mm -hmm. uh, a note for producers and production would be to include a or consider including a conceptual rigging or conceptual animation phase in the same way that you would have conceptual design. Yeah, because in pre-production you have character designers, you have uh, people that are gonna like make like background and stuff. But rarely you have someone who's like, "Hey, that thing is not riggable," or like that thing could be done that way so that puppets mm. are easier. No, it's it may never be, there. It may be worth <laughs> rigging the first couple of characters two or three different ways passing them off to a lead animator and just seeing what feedback they have. Mm -hmm. Anybody can, anybody with um, uh, like can give feedback on a design. You just look at an image, right? But only another rigger is able to give feedback on the rig itself by really digging in there and uh, digging into the guts or other animators when they directly experience it. Uh, so like this rig, for example, uh, is one that was designed to be, oh, it's leaving. It's going away. It's I'm going kidding. away. I can come back to it later. <laughs> no, I was kidding you. <laughs> okay, so in trying to figure out uh, what is um, the right way to do, to, to, kind of lost my chain of thought there. <laughs> uh, this one was built uh, to, he's only an extra. He only appears in like two or three shots. Uh, so if you only had one method of rigging everything and it had like the arms were upper arm, lower arm, hand, sleeve, everything's cutting in and out of each other and it has all of these different parts, um, it would take a very long time Forever. to pose. But if you watch the storyboard and say, hang on, they only appear in three shots and they spend the entire time sitting behind a desk from waist up with their arms folded, you'd be out of your mind to rig their legs at all, even though they were designed. You'd save a lot of time by just not bothering about that. Uh, so what I ended up doing for this character is you'll notice here that the arms and legs are just, a, <laughs> they're just a single piece. Wait. Um, so, so it sort of embraces the fact that uh, it, it goes into a full hybrid, right? So cutout is very much a spectrum. It isn't just traditional and cutout as two independent things. It goes all the way from full traditional with maybe adding like a peg here and there. And then on the other end, you've probably got rigs, but you still do some drawing swap outs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this one em embraces that by having uh, the arms and legs uh, fully traditional. There is no way to rig them aside from just pivoting at the shoulder. I am expecting the animator in this case to swap out the drawing substitutions every step of the way uh, and try and save some time with things like the, the face. So, so like the head is probably about 80% rigged. Like the face goes inside the head there. Um, and the pupil is independent from the rest of the eye. But I haven't gone so crazy in regards to like the upper and lower eyelid are separated into their own masks. The eyebrows are, you know, not like a fully independent thing. I haven't got upper teeth, lower teeth, tongue, full mouth assembly. It's just one layer with drawing substitutions. Mm -hmm. Like honestly, the it always feels like full traditional might always take longer, but that's not necessarily true. 
one of the shots this character has is walking towards the camera with a very confident walk with the shoes flipping up and down all over the place to try and pose that with cutout would take forever to build and it would take forever to pose, but it would probably only take a fraction of the time to just draw it because yeah. it's probably only going to have about a five frame loop. Uh, so the animator would actually breathe a sigh of relief to not have to manage so many layers. And this uh, is actually called hybrid animation for those of you who are curious. And there's, there's so many different ways to approach hybrid and it's, um, uh, exploring it and thinking about it is, I think, a really exciting part because you get to talk to all the animators and see what they really want um, and give them what they actually need. But it can be difficult for some riggers to swallow because you want to, like, I know I at least really want to uh, go overboard. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's just not what they want. And uh, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that before. Um, um, you made this crazy cool project called Royal Pain. Yes. And your rigs that you made yourself um, are really cool, by the way. I love oh, them. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I think that is something that unites us three. We learned rigging not because, because I hear it often. That's also another misconception. <laughs> Some people want to learn rigging because it's an amazing, because, because like it's a job. Like, oh, there's job openings and rigging, learn to do rigging, you're going to have a fantastic career, which mm -hmm. is true to some extent. But oftentimes, people who do rigging, they don't just do it because of the job. They do it out of necessity. Like, I learned to rig not because I, I wanted to be the best rigger in the world, but I learned to rig out of necessity. I wanted to make my things move. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that kind of rings a bell for your rigs as well. You wanted to tell a story. You're an animator by trade, and you, you know, you took it upon yourself to learn rigging. So do you have some things to say about that, about your cool project? Yeah, so OK, so this is Michelangelo. Uh, my very first rig, I think, yeah, you have to go in the, there you go. Would you like to share your screen so that you can show us yeah, your rig? You know it. Yeah, yeah so. sure, I can do that. Uh, All right. Oh, Janelle, help us share the screen. OK, uh, just let me know if you guys can see it. In the meantime, I want to thank everyone who's there because you are all amazing and beautiful and we Aww. appreciate your time. You know what? See if it, is there any questions right now? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm looking through now and trying to see which one we can integrate in our talk. Oh, people are talking about IKFK. I'm going to take a little note on that because we absolutely need to talk about that because it's a big subject. Yes. Okay. Just let me know if you guys can see. I can see it. Oh, I, like, yeah, yeah. I love that rig. It's so beautiful. Okay, so can you see the My Little Persona? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have her, her. So Michelangelo was my very first rig. Uh, so I am an animator by default. And I wanted to make my own short. Um, and I was like, well, this is a perfect time to learn rigging. And I had no, uh, zero knowledge about rigging. Um, I just had someone at work just kind of gave me the very basics of rigging. And then he said, okay, there you go. Now have at it. <laughs> so from there, um, like a lot of trial and error, like the way I set up Michelangelo's rig, I wouldn't do it for my next round. Like I, I was really big into putting everything in groups. Um, and it, it works. But I find now it's easier just to kind of have everything all in one layout, personally for me. Uh, I think that's like everyone's a bit different because I've looked at rigs from Ireland. I've looked at rigs from like Australia. And I know it's like everyone rigs differently. <laughs> and can you guys hear me? Hello. Yes, we hear you. Oh, okay, okay. It was it was super, it was super quiet. So yeah, but you you were doing you were just explaining something, yep. and I didn't want to interrupt. We're on oh, the okay. FBR speaks with um. Yeah. I, I'm really just like absorbing all you're saying because it's so great. Yeah. So like, as my first rig, like I can already see like the peg wasn't properly uh, placed, but that's okay because. Like, as I'm rigging, I'm learning more stuff. And now I have knowledge. And I'm like, okay, so the next round of rigs, I'm going to learn, like, from the mistakes that I've made on this rig and, like, apply it to my new stuff. And, um... Oh, Rebecca, Rebecca. Yes? Another rigging misconception. You can actually learn everything about rigging in school. 
<laughs> oh, I I did not I did not learn any rigging at school. Me at too. All. Yeah, I think we um, went to school a bit too much before, but is that starting to change? No, but what I mean is that even if I teach you how to rig, even if Colin or Rebecca teach you how to rig, you only know the one person of things that I will teach you. Like, and one of the biggest hardest thing, at least that I know for me in terms of rigging, is not learning how to connect the nodes, is learning how where to place these crazy pivot points mm -hmm. like learning where to put them is so unique mm. so when i talk like i mean that's i think that's one of our first conversation together i was like i was like if you were to rig like a hair where would you put the pivot and stuff like when i talk to riggers like i rarely ask about their system because i can do that like i like the compositing like the blue node part i don't care mm -hmm. i want to know how you do hierarchies because that's the real hard part of rigging. Where do you place the pivots? Where do you place your yeah? How do controls? you break? How do you break your pieces? How do you play, play your place your pivot and stuff? So, what you're saying rings so many bells for me because I'm like, it's exactly the same. Like, learning where to place a pivot is so hard, and you learn it by trying. So yeah, because yeah. Uh, I, I would be animating, and then I would try to, I would be like, oops, I gotta move this. But I learn that if you do it mid animation it's going to move all your pegs oh you're talking about this one yeah Moving the main pivot. yeah mm -hmm. yeah the no, that... advanced pivot and the regular pivot so you learn that by yourself that's a hard one to learn on yourself and so <laughs> go through no, that. no it's okay because like i was animated I'm like why well, it's just not working <laughs> uh, and then i was like oh it's because of that mm. uh rebecca how do you feel about uh curve deformers versus like envelope or curve envelope, as or we curve call them in Montreal. Curve deformers. Uh, I a curve with an envelope deformer so that you can move both ends. I yeah. only use um, the envelope. Exactly. Do you think that's <laughs> been a changing trend over the last few years that we used to see more uh, curves and curve lopes like um, five I years ago and now it's just more and more envelopes? I think, well, Tangled was the very first show I worked on and I remember everything was envelope. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You only worked i think recently like you did most of your work for like mercury filmworks and i just know that yeah like, yeah that's the only curve. studio that's <laughs> the, so that's the only studio i've ever worked with um maybe that's been more in my experience then i've noticed a trend that as the years have gone on um going from traditional bones to mm -hmm. just being able to like mold things like clay is the way to go rigging is like fan like fancy cleanup a mm -hmm. lot of people will but then again, it depends on the style. It does rigging. depend on the style. I see the curve a lot hand. when I teach into studios that are going to do more limited animation. And by limited, I don't mean bad. Limited animation is great. It's just animation you make faster. What kind of acting do you need to do? Actually, yeah. that's a good point. Um, demos and clever turnarounds. Oh, my God. What are your thoughts on those? Okay. So, I mean, I want to hear all of you guys have to say. But <laughs> when I see, because I, back then, you know, before working at Toon Boom, I worked in the studio, right? And I had to, you know, have, like, people that were applying to be into the rigging team. And um, when I was looking at demo reels, like... Oh, someone, <laughs> says, I, someone says I can't hear or see anything. Um, are you guys able no, to... No, but you're screen sharing. <laughs> oh, no, it was just someone else saying in the chat. Uh, it might be... Is there something wrong? Yeah, it might oh. be. It must be on their end, or is it all of us? Uh, I everyone, see, I is see. That, are you guys able to see and hear us? Yeah, I okay. see. Yeah. Oh, no, someone see. says, I can see. I can hear and see. Okay. Maybe you need to refresh the page. Yeah, you might have to refresh it. Okay. Oh, what we were saying for the... Thank you for letting us know, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I just... <laughs> what we were saying is, maybe you guys agree, but like, when I see demo reels, oftentimes what I see is people having their rig and we all do that but it's so cool when you see a rig turn around and it's smooth and it's beautiful right but as a rigging as someone who hires other riggers what i want to see is how your rig can move like i don't i don't care mm -hmm. how it rotates i want to see how someone can make animation with it so um if you want to like Another misconception is that if the turn is perfect the animation will be perfect as well it's like no yeah. like um try if you want to know okay yeah okay. if you want to know if your rig is great make one pose with it that is like mm -hmm. more complex than like waving <laughs> yeah yeah something that yeah. like try try to draw the pose first and see if you can make the rig match that pose mm -hmm. uh because like a lot of the demos we're sort of just doing on camera now is just like pivoting things on the arms but we all know that that marionette style animation in a lot of productions isn't going to fly. Oh, yeah. when these... I showed my rig, it was, it had crazy poses. <laughs> so how do you go about doing foreshortening? There's a lot of solutions for it, but um, 
yeah, uh, a smooth turn and a smooth demo uh, doesn't necessarily mean easy to animate, uh, which means, uh, which going on from that, do you guys believe that there are any misconceptions out there involving master controllers right now? Oh, oh, and that goes with one of the questions we received in the chat. Uh, Fabio Jeffrey, I hope I said it right, says, do you think master controllers are a necessary part of modern rigs these days, like for main cast member of a show? So, um, yeah, like maybe you can talk about some misconceptions about master controllers in general. What are your guys' both experience with master controllers? Uh, I have a love-hate relationship for them. Me too. <laughs> I think that's common. Okay. Yeah. Because this involves what we were talking about with really nice turns and demos don't mm -hmm. mean easy to work with uh, because I think a lot of people will see, you know, pulling all the levers around and it looks like this fantastic action figure. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> that's when you actually get in there and try and make a custom pose, like yeah. we just suggested, it's suddenly a very different story. And before we start, I just want to say something really clear for me uh, at least. I think master controllers are a posing tool more than an animation tool. There so you go. use them to pose your character somewhere in an angle and like stick it there. And then most of the work is still done by hand. Like master controllers are not going to magically create an image for you. And mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, Rebecca? Yeah, no, um, I don't. So one thing I that kind of irks me is when people show me their master controllers and they have all like, everything planned out inside Ugh, like control. thousands of little windows yeah. so like, so like good, look, this, one, this one has like all the little blankies and i'm like or i could just switch it to the drawing <laughs> indeed and this leads us into uh, the misconception that as rigging continues to evolve and become naturally more complicated that we are going to start to mirror what the 3d industry is doing but yeah. that's not necessarily true because as it gets more complicated it gets to the point where Frankly, you might as well do a cell shaded 3D show. The whole benefit of this medium of 2D is that nothing will ever have more control than just drawing on a blank page. Mm -hmm. And we have a tremendous advantage in 2D that as soon as something gets a little bit too messy, you can just lop off the whole arm and draw a fresh one. And we want to be able to keep that. If rigs get so complicated to the point where if anything that isn't represented in a lever is physically not possible, uh, you've just limited it yourselves. And I've seen a few rigs and riggers where it has gotten so complicated that in order to pull off the desired amount of poses possible, it probably would have been faster if they had just built a 3D one. Because mm -hmm. those sort of pseudo 2.5D ones where it does a very, it looks three dimensional as it turns, looks very, very impressive. How often do you actually need your character to be in full profile or full mm -hmm. front facing? When you could have put all your energy into the four fifths and three quarter, and or that sort of stuff. even like sometimes the hardest part is to go from like front to profile in a very smooth way. But like, do you need that? Like, what are the odds that your character is going to slowly turn from front to profile? Mm -hmm. It's animation. Usually, we just like whoop and it turns. So yeah, I mean, I there are, there are some shows that do require that, um, and exactly. that's that's when the heavier rigs like make more sense. Mm -hmm. So do you guys find that um, we should be spending more time thinking about what tools do we not need in a rig and just leave those out? Rig for 70% of your storyboard. 70% of storyboard, that's a good one. Because <laughs> um, I think a CPU load is something that is often forgotten. Uh, just how slow does the computer get once it's got all of the stuff in there? It might feel good for one rig, but if you've got a crowd shot happening, mm -hmm. how sad is that animator going to get? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I've seen some pretty sad animators. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of solutions now with things like, you know, extra displays and caching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like we're trying to help. Like Toon Boom is actively trying to make the software faster and faster, but people need to realize <laughs> that you might not need 5,000 deformers, weighted mm -hmm. deformers, in your rig for it to work. I think, just saying. I think I believe there's a beautiful push and pull between <laughs> development at Toon Boom and the end user where... Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, the developers create some features and then uh, the the users take it well beyond 100% that. Uh, and then developers are like, oh, that's cool. And then try and keep up. And we're all kind of innovating together. Which but is a little fun. disclaimer, at Toon Boom, yeah. we do love to see people pushing limits because that's how we make our software better. Yeah, I know what to focus Just on like next. 6,000 weighted deformer. Like, that's, that's a lot. Mm. Be careful. <laughs> oh, but new things like weighted deformer and point kinematics have really been a game changer. Yeah. Not to mention the retiming. No, I love weighted performers. Um, you do have to be careful, not like you just got to be careful, like which ones you want to choose to put yep. the weighted performers. 
I saw that happen just recently, actually. Uh, it was on a rig where it was providing the option of both curve, uh, curvelope and envelope arms which and legs. Which common in the past. Uh, which is, yeah, it's, we still see quite a bit um, where it switches yeah. between the two modes on the drawing substitution. It's a pretty clever technique and I really like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but where it started to become a bit of a burden was uh, the dependent pieces, the lower arms and the lower legs, were being held in place with point kinematics. And when all four of them were together on the character, it just grinded to a halt. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we reached a point uh, where we realized that all of most of the notes that were coming back were on the curve-based shots. So it was better to just do envelope animation for basically everything. Yeah. We ripped out the curve deformers from a lot of the main characters and everything became immediately way faster. Yeah, if I, I can show you guys real quick. Oh, like I, I love I, that one. <laughs> so I, this is, I did a medic, uh, an animation with a character called the Medic from the Team Fortress 2. And uh, the voice actor did some lines just for fun. I was like, oh, I, I kind of want to like animate that. So... I made it such a simple rig. Like, it's just one body part. But I use it the way it deformers inside the shirt. Mm. So actually, like, you can move um, the collar and, like, the... the That's the a wonderful collar. use of the white. Yeah, and also the hair. Like, mm. normally you would have these two lines, like, separate and then put them inside. But with the way it deformers, like, I can move. Yeah. That's what I did for my hair? elf dude. He has like chain mail, and instead of hiding every like lens of chain mail on another thing, I'm like 90% of the time the weighted different will be enough. And if I have a scene where you know it needs another angle that is more crazy, heck for that scene, I will just re-rig that small part. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Yeah. This and is like a really beautiful example, actually, because I think uh, I know I keep ha uh, we keep hammering in the whole um you know, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've also seen that go so far in the other extreme where uh, some people have been uh, afraid or nervous to use weighted deformers at all because they've heard that they're heavy. Uh, but I mean, look at that. That's a really clever use of it. And it's yeah, look, like, right. top at all. Woo, it's so, so that's right. performing like butter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's also just a personal shirt. But... <laughs> um, if I can steal the screen after you're done with this example. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, do I just stop sharing? Um, someone says, is, is weighted deformer the same as freeform deformer? No, freeform deformer is, um, it's a bit different. I can show it later, but like the freeform deformer is kind of usually made to move textures along a hand drawn animation. That's usually how it's used to. And it's basically like it's not the same. The weighted deformer is, um, like the weighted deformer is, uh, I'm gonna show you because I, I have one in his hair. Um, give me one second. My keyboard was all over the place. Um, yeah, so uh, this piece of hair has an envelope in it and it moves. Well, by the way, my computer is having a bit of issues because we are streaming and have seven scenes open and they have both. They all have pretty high quality rigs in there. But hey, you know, it's managing. Uh, so you see, this moves well, but everybody knows that the envelopes is legendary. <laughs> for being really bad at handling textures. That's just a limitation we've been facing for years. So if that was a raid that I made in Harmony 19 and before, no, 17, because there's no 19, what am I saying? 17 and before, mm -hmm. that little swoop of like curvy texture should have been its own layer and you just cut it on top. Um, uh, and it would, because otherwise the curve deformer would have like ruined it. <laughs> mm. yeah, the envelope. Are, yeah, are you able to show them like if you could turn off the weighted deformer? Maybe. Show yeah, them. that's what I did. Look, it oh, did you? Ugly. Yeah, that texture breaks real good. It breaks. Oh, there it is. But the weighted ah. deform deformer <laughs> makes it better. But then, because you know, I teach harmony all the time. People are like, "Yeah, but why doesn't all the envelopes always do that?" And the answer is because it's really heavy. Yeah, ninety percent of the time you don't need it if there's nothing in the middle. Yeah, this <laughs> one I put it there because otherwise, like other than that, the rig is pretty simple in terms of like things mm. but like for the number of time that i need uh, is otherwise each time i move this like it's like exactly for your guy with his hair each time i would have needed to move this where like now i can just do like woo, and it's just faster <laughs> and i did the same i think for these chain mails yeah these chain mail they're just like one piece and it's like whoop Mm, less pieces. Exactly. So when, so when I went time there. So when creating things like hair and stuff like that, because this character has lots and lots of uh, I need points, to redo them. <laughs> does it take a long time to pose? Where do you feel the limit is on uh, the amount of points? Don't talk about the hair. I need to re-rig them. Well, is it a... um? Uh, 
Is it something that you need to stop and think about? Because the reflex, <laughs> I think, would be to add a point onto every strand. Uh, but then that's just more things to pose in the long run, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe, Rebecca, like, you have other things to say about hair, and I really want to hear it in a, in a, in a second, because you've done a lot of different characters with different types of hair. And, um, um, like, but, but when I rig hair, what I think is the most important thing is at least to separate them in three. Mm -hmm. So you have the hair that is in front, like, you know, like this hair. And you have the hair that is behind on top in that case. And then the hair that is behind, like, the neck. Or like if it had like, you know, longer hair. And that's because if I want to get a angle over my head, it's just quicker to just take like that thing and like, you know, push it up to have a like a tilt. And like you can get an easier tilt by moving like these three layers. Mm. Um, and that comes because my my one of my biggest cutout experience was working on Wakfu, which was a show that was like anime, but cut out. <laughs> and these characters had lots of hair trend. And this is how we would do it. Uh, to get our easy tilts. So that was a way that you could, with one control, move a lot of pieces rather than having yeah. to, you know, Set eight manual. points around <laughs> each lump, move them all up yeah. one at a time. So we would do like front, behind, and back. That's what we would do. Mm -hmm. And they're very easy to just um, remove so, and stuff. So something that does send, tend to set a lot of rookie riggers apart from the professionals is and it really only comes with practice is where is the balance on how many points you add? Because mm -hmm. it feels like, you know, the more points, the more control. The least but possible. <laughs> the, yeah, the more points you add, the longer it's going to take to pose. But if there's too few, then you're not going to be able to get the pose you want. Uh, and trying to, it's it's like puzzle solving, trying to figure out that balance, uh, not just for the amount of points, but also how your cutting and masking and auto patching theory works. And and sometimes uh, that's what I want. That's what I want to get next. Uh, sometimes, do you really need an envelope, or do you just need like a curve? That's because what sometimes... I really love about this character in particular <laughs> is that it's very clearly designed for rigged. First well, yeah. things first, no outlines. Well, <laughs> yeah, but no outlines doesn't always mean easier. There's, Depends on your style. There would be less auto patching, though. No? There's no auto patching. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there is just because, for the sake of my tutorials, I did auto patch the arms, but like, no, there is auto patch. I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> no, there, yeah. I think there is auto patches. So I think this might. Uh, there is. I yeah. didn't patch them in the end because I added a line to them. Because if I take, if I took the arm and I put it in front of his torso, we didn't see it, so I just put an arm. So can we talk a bit about line. designing for for rigs? No, but I... before that, I want to oh, hear yeah, no, Rebecca's thought on hair because we didn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh no. Sorry. Okay. Um. So what you said, I mostly agree with. I find like the the only times I like to put more detail and more rigs or, or more deformers is if it's a more of an up close shot. Exactly, like yeah. a very good close up with wind. <laughs> yeah, then then yeah, then it makes more sense to put envelopes and curves because then you have more to work with. Like if um, this was a close up, I think like because here I had only curves because usually like you know most of your shots are like that far, so you know you can just. Like, mm -hmm. whoop, whoop. But if it was a close up, I would just re rig it. I would remove the curve and just put an envelope, right? Yeah, yeah that's what I would do too. Like just at sometimes I'll just like I'll duplicate a drawing and then just add a new um, envelope. Just so I have like the old drawing with the old envelopes, just in case. Okay, um, so it's quite normal for you to add new envelopes and things on the fly mid movement. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, how often do you find yourself adding new substitutions on the fly? All the time. Um, for my personal stuff, like yeah, all hmm. the time. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard a lot of mixed opinions on that. Like, like working with the same rigs, different animators will say. Oh yeah, I create new uh, substitutions all the time, and then there's others who are like, they're like, no, 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 no. You, you like, you must work with the pieces that are available to you because then it's easier to fix notes later. Oh uh, no, it I'll, I'll draw my own parts. Yeah. What was that? Uh, I'll draw my own parts. Like you draw um, your own parts all the time. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, like, I will try to work with what I have, just depending if I have enough time. So do you find, therefore, that there's some rigs that are easier to modulate than others? Like, do you think riggers need to be keeping in mind more often, hey, how can I make this easier for an animator to create oh. a new a new piece yes. uh, whenever they need to and not break things? Oh, yeah. Like, I think communication between riggers and animators, mm. I, I think, do need to be a, a bit stronger. Does like, that come into play with things like... Um, like excessive auto patching? Like, if, if there's too much uh, layer interactivity, that will make it hard to... Yeah, because um, to play well. 
Yeah, because I know I was working with one rig, not at the studio, but it was um, outside the studio. And um, I wanted to draw a new hand, but the way they rigged the the character, it was like I couldn't just say create new hand for some somehow like oh, it was broken. It it was like in a different group, so I had to go inside that group to get oh. to the drawing. And then I had to draw the new part there, but then I had to go to another part of the place just to use the paint bucket. And I was like, well, that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe <laughs> I think by technical stance, maybe it made sense the way they laid it out. Do you feel like a lot um, of this can be solved with just solid documentation for the team? Yeah. And like, um, just be open. Like, so if if you have a problem with the rig, like the first thing is like, don't be rude <laughs> to the, to the rig artist. Because oh, yeah, may maybe to them, they're like, this is perfect. Like, this makes sense. And then to an animator, they're like, well, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, just like, hey, like, I noticed when I try to make a new a new drawing, it doesn't work. Like, let's maybe we can figure out, like, what's going on. And if there's, like, just an easy, quick fix. Mm. Is yeah. it very common in your guys' opinion uh, and experience uh, that rigs will be getting updated uh, mid-production? <laughs> um, I th like, how I high do their version numbers get? Like I know, like we'll we'll keep notes for um the rigs and like what works, what doesn't work. I'm not entirely sure like how much they get updated. I can't say like, I can't say like for sure. It changes every studio, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what I wanted to say about that is it can be pretty normal because mm -hmm. animators will have feedback and you want to update them as you go. Um, and that's why sort of having more time in pre-production to, I guess, practice and do conceptual passes first. Well, I um, think what's really important is like do the rig and then give it to someone and say, give it to an animator. Yeah, I think <laughs> does, it's often, does this work instead of like waiting till the production starts and then all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> oh no, there's like 200 people saying this doesn't work. Yeah, I think it can be a bit of an afterthought um, mm -hmm. on some productions that it's just like, oh, you know, like. Rigging is just like, oh, you just build it, right? Like, and it's like, no, it's, well, a, it's a slow process. You can't start them on the same day that animation begins. But also, like, you got to understand, too, like, in studios, like, the, the rig team, like, they they work really hard. They do. Uh, there's not a whole lot of time for them to test their There's not enough. That's the thing. There's not enough time. And, like, it's not fair to get them to test, like, each one out all the time. That's why I think it's too important just to throw it to an animator. I, yeah, I believe it would be important yeah. in pre-production before the animation team comes on proper to consider there being an animator who is a part of the rigging team. And that's, yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. Um, um, speaking, therefore, of design, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it's a very rare opportunity that we get to design characters with rigging in mind. Normally, mm -hmm. it's just about what's aesthetically pleasing first. Yeah, because of what I was saying before, oftentimes, well, less and less today. But, but it would be nice. But in the past, people were like, I want to make it hand drawn. It's too expensive. I'm going to rig mm. these hand drawn designs, which were thought and engineered for hand drawn. Yeah. And I think that this comes from like when you go to animation school, and I'm not blaming anyone, I'm just like stating <laughs> facts. When you go to animation school, usually you learn to design for hand drawn. And so, character designers, they will never rig in their life, they will never animate anything, probably. And, and the rules of what makes for a good traditional character design Are changes, not the isn't same it? For like, a, for we all learn in traditional like hey maybe you shouldn't give your character seven buckles like, and belts everywhere because you got to draw it over and over again like this chain mail yep. for hand-drawn animation is the big no-no because oh my god keeping track of this is, keeping track of, of this in cutout is so easy it's, mm -hmm. it's there right so sometimes I, and i think this is, this is going to change but a lot of the like um discussion i have with like character designers is that character designers design like what what we learn in in school and stuff and and during the job is we learn to design pretty things and things that works for hand drawn but not not so much thought is made for like is it riggable mm -hmm. and it is a thought a lot for 3D like like Kung Fu Panda all these years ago they needed to have kimono kimono have like these long flowy sleeve and that's a story I heard from like a workshop and they were like yeah we can't uh, 3D is not there yet. Sorry, character designers. I love your kimonos, but we cannot use them. 3D cannot do it. And then people just like, okay, well, characters will not have flowy sleeve kimonos. We're going to make them short, like very tight sleeve or like no loose hair or something. 
But usually if it's cut out and we say, yeah, it's a bit hard to rig, usually the answer is like, oh, you're too lazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> It is. It is something we have to Could deal have with. That so, stigma. Yeah, so what I are just some hope that is going to change in the following? So years. what are some common character design traits you've both encountered that make rigged animation more difficult that designers may want to reconsider? I want to hear your answer, Rebecca, because <laughs> you animate more than we do. <laughs> um, like I said before, they put a lot of the comp uh, solutions within the animation stage. So things like so, pre-lighting and textures and things. Textures, blush. Uh, a lot of auto patching, um, like when an arm goes in front of something, like the line automatically readjusts it, which is like cool. It's that that's cool, but um, it just sucks because it feels like more and more comp issues are now being pushed to animators, and but we're still given the same amount of time. Yep. Um, right. So it's just kind of like one of those things where we got to figure out, like, okay, like is there a way? We can make the rigs lighter and um, kind of push the comp issues, you know, to the, the to comp team. <laughs> I found it's been um, very effective to have the lead rigger have a certain level of authority in design, like they actually mm -hmm. have an approval pass and can go back and say, actually, can we can we remove the band aid from this character's knee? That would make... Oh, the rotation points. Don't put details on rotation points, yeah. please. Elbows and knees. Oh, my God. <laughs> or if you do, please have, like, a thought for us when we're going to animate it, okay? Like, do it if it... it okay. Ch character designs. Little tip that I've been heard in school. It's amazing. If a detail doesn't bring anything to your story, reconsider it. <laughs> <laughs> if it just... Yeah. Cool, but it costs, like, $3,000 more to animated like may like is it really necessary like if the band-aid is a key point to your story like add it it's, it's fine but, like mm -hmm. choose your battle folks <laughs> yeah Joint, joints seem to be like the equivalent of over detailed <laughs> characters now they're the hardest thing to manage and uh, oh, oh, we yes. have someone in the chat like Elodie Rabiar who is an amazing rigger uh I worked with that person long ago and they're amazing and they say that uh, they also advise um animation lead and supervisor to um, test the rig. And I mean, not not like that the animation leader supervisor like insists that I want to test the rig, but like your studio, you really would benefit from having your rig be tested out by your, you know, lead animator because he's the, well, he, they are the one who are going to give like retakes and, and, you know, handle your team and stuff. So it's mm -hmm. a teamwork. Like, and like Rebecca, you said, like animators should be kinder to riggers and riggers should be kinder to animators in general. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's a teamwork. So if that lead animator is able to speak the language of both the rigging team and the animation team, like like in their notes, they can say, oh yeah, I know that's built like this. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, true. They've experienced it firsthand. Yeah, because I do find like the rig team and the animation team is like day and night. Like they almost don't talk to each other at times. And there needs to be a lot more synergy. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's like more like hostility towards one another. Like not. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> maybe that's not the what? word. Like. Um... There's a there's a gap. There's a gap. There you go. Thank you. Like, because like if there's an issue with the rig, like if the rig artist doesn't know, how are they going to help? Yeah. Um, if like the animators are just complaining about it, but nothing's being done about it. Um, also, um, uh, one big question we got in the chat. Mm -hmm. was, um, I can't find it again, but somebody asked uh, if they want to learn, because I answered it in the chat. Anyway, they were saying like, oh, what's the best way to learn rigging? Like, okay, yeah, the, the question was what? what type of rig is the best one to start with like be because i've heard that humans were hard and i really want us to answer that question because i i well we get it all the time and for me from my point of view um if you're going to rig don't necessarily go for like um someone who teaches you how to rig a character from a to z mm -hmm. because there's so many ways to rig and maybe the way that they rig is their way but <laughs> this might be over the top for your first attempt. Yeah, don't do that. Like, first attempt, okay. Everybody's like, I have this amazing anime story in my head. I want to make a pilot that is 35 minutes and I will rig everything. And Let, I've never rigged in my life. Yeah, do you have my Let rig? Them grow. Yeah, Let rig, them grow naturally. Rig an eye, then rig an arm, mm. rig mm -hmm. a leg, rig just a head, maybe just a mouth. And it's not about what you rig, it's about how many you rig. 
Yeah. Like just make mistakes because you will make mistakes your first rig. Like mm -hmm. that's not my first rig. <laughs> yeah, start, start with like a little jelly character or something. Like like rig as you animate. It's like, oh, okay, I need to make this movement now. And then you like bolt a few pieces on. Like when you're in production, you wouldn't do it that way. But it's, mm -hmm. it really is the best way to learn because you you encounter the tools you need as you need them. And you experiment and innovate and find solutions that are there. Uh, and eventually you'll start to synergize with like, yes, there are industry standard ways of doing it, uh, but to really understand the reasons why they are that way, you kind of need to, like, like, it can be helpful to encounter all of the mistakes and pitfalls first. I know that might feel like it takes longer, but you'll be a lot more hardened by the time you reach that point. Rebecca, what is the first thing you rigged? Uh, it was Michelangelo. Oh, nice. Do you have it there? Yeah, I showed it to you guys, remember? Yeah, he, well, it's like, a little uh, jester guy. I have oh, it right here. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you guys have him too. No, he was and my very the... first character. You had an interesting route, though, because you'd worked with the industry standard level rigs before building your own first one. Yeah, so that counts as experience because, yes, you, it was your first rig, but you've spent like a lot of time animating before. So, mm. yeah, and I worked in the node view a lot. So, I yeah, you were doing not a junior. So, <laughs> so for someone who's uh, brand new, like even then, this is pretty, pretty tight. Because you got like a few levels of groups and things going mm -hmm. on, um, but like for people who are newer to harmony and stuff, I I respect that the node view can often look intimidating. Mm -hmm. But I promise that you you get to this point by accident because you kind of just add parts and eventually it's just yeah, it just kind of looks like that. it's organic. You start <laughs> Very with this and you connect stuff together. Like you don't mm. just like it's not like a chicken lays an egg. Like you just you don't just like boop and yeah. then it's like that. Like you start with the hair. Then once you're done, you go to something else and something else. And... I've, ha I've had a number of students that like, like, like get quite anxious about looking at that. And they wonder <laughs> is, is it all planned at the very start? Nope. And do you kind of just yeah. like build it and connect yeah. it all together? And it's, it's like, a journey. No, it's, it's, it's a journey. I find rigging so much fun um, just because there's a lot of problem solving. Yeah. And, I, I, um, the puzzle solving aspect is really um uh, entertaining. <laughs> yeah, and I think what's really cool, the really cool feeling is like when you got your rig done and you actually get an animation done with it, you're like, wow, yeah. like it works. <laughs> That's true. And, and you're like and you're like, wow, my character's coming to life. And it's such a I don't know, it's such a cool feeling. We've spent a lot of time here talking about like the in, uh, like industry level stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but we should probably give a bit of time to like the hobbyists, uh, the enthusiasts, just like people mm -hmm. working on okay. solo projects, music nah. videos, and pilots and things. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different method. I'm kidding. Um, and I, I, well, my heart goes out to those people a bit because a lot of the resources out there is about this really high tier stuff, and it can be a bit a, a bit intimidating because you think like, oh man, do I really need to spend two weeks building my character in order to make my thirty second short? Uh, when in reality, you, well, I mean, if, if, if they, you go that route of just sort of building as you practice, uh, as, you'll probably find you. Yeah. If they like to know, like Michelangelo took me the weekend. Like took you the, the weekend. Fantastic. It was yeah. the same for that ferret one I was showing earlier because it's like, you know, deliberately only for a few shots. I think it was about five hours ish. Mm -hmm. And like, like what a difference that is compared to like a main character in a twenty-two episode series where it's quite common for it to take a week and a half. If yeah, not there's a lot of problem solving too. Like, you got to make sure it all works. Mm. I mean, oh, and yeah, oh. there, like there's issues with this rig right now. But um, like I said, like the next time I I'm gonna rebuild these characters. I want to build mine as well. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that, and a lot of those little things, it's like it's so subtle that there's no way to know until you hit that when animating. Hey, like finding. Finding seams like the anti-aliasing and learning how to avoid that in your build rather than trying to brute force them out with patches. Yeah, I said okay, I said I said Wu, because that's my character, was not my first rig, but it, it is my first character rig. It's the first time I rigged a character. <laughs> that was the first one I I laid out. But um before that, like I said, I did like eyes and arms and I did a lot of small things. Like one of the characters I would often rig was Henry the Egg. And um, I really advise everybody to rig it because it's so fun. But you just, oh no, I saved. Uh, you just rig something like that. And uh, with like two eyes, maybe you put a nose and like, you just give it legs. If you can rig that, great. Like just something, yeah. so if she feels spicy, give it a, like a party hat. Yeah, you got a head, mask a face. Maybe yeah. a you have a legs. body, you can put like, and it supports all your envelopes. So like envelopes for the body, maybe like a curve here for the nose. That's a wonderful example. It you almost feels like the, the equivalent of like 
it's like the bouncy ball of rigging. You kind of experience a little bit of everything of in one go. The other thing I always do for beginners is like the, the bird rig. It's like a little shape with two eyes, a mouth that is a beak, so it's not actually a mouth, so it's either rig. It's got wings for arms, so you don't have to connect a, a hand to an arm because that's complicated. And then it's, it's got legs without feet because feet are complicated. So like just start with something like that. And if you feel spicy, you can add a mask to spicy. it. <laughs> you can add a mask to it to learn how to oh, how to cut things into something. Mm, give it a little feather on its head. That is my go-to to learn rigging. And you know, and you can exchange these. You can make like maybe like a longer bird with like shorter wings and stubby legs, but like the essence should be the same. And this is, at least for me, my go-to to learn rigging when you're really like a baby without <laughs> any experience. Like, don't start with that. Like, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I give uh, one more example no. of something like really radically oh. different? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for uh, when it comes to experimenting with the less conventional techniques, because there's a lot of other tools out there like the constraint nodes and dynamic springs uh, and things like that. Um, it tends to come up a little bit more for smaller projects. And I, I guess to summarize this entire talk, it would be to um, thinking through what very particular problems are you trying to solve and how can you do it in the simplest way possible? Uh, and an occasion where those quote unquote more of engineered methods have come into play. Um, I did like a music video once where it was essentially just like a head singing at the camera the entire time. And I only had about two one and a half to two weeks to pull it off. Mm -hmm. So having lots of envelopes and things everywhere wasn't really going to cut it to be able to pose it around. And it turned out that like the easiest way to do it would not have flied in a television production at all because it would have been way too limited for other animators to work with. Yeah. But it was fair. It would have pulled off this one specific need I needed very, very well. It was good for um, you. It was great for me because it was made of um, a whole bunch of layers displaced in 3D space a little bit in order to create the sort of rotation illusion. You could only get about 17 degrees of movement in every angle before it started to fall apart. But I was able to get that rotation from a single peg in the middle. So I was able to pump out the three minutes of animation in basically an afternoon. <laughs> um, so uh, depending on the kind, I guess what I just want to give that as an example of how broad the projects can get and where experimenting can come into play. Um, yeah, we've only got about five minutes left. Is there yeah. any more questions we should uh, be covering? Um, well, mine says two minutes. <laughs> oh, bye. Um, I mean, what I want us to say is that I can be found on YouTube. Uh, if you look at the bird brain on YouTube, Cutting can be, can be uh, found with onion skin. And Rebecca has an amazing Twitter page, and you should all check them. So. Yeah, the chat kept giving me the the whip the like my old old uh, Whipex. Uh, I get to remember what it's called. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna put our links in the chat. So yes. Let's do them because this conversation is not over. It's an everlasting conversation, and I really hope that we'll be able to gather or each of us together again to have that talk because I've been oh, having yeah. the time of my life. Yeah, definitely. We're, <laughs> and, uh, we're all pretty active. So like, you know, feel free to be in touch on Twitter or whatever. Um, we're all like, pretty friendly. Like this is, it's a very integrated community where like... Oops. <laughs> I'm sorry it kicked us out.